So, like I said, uh, the primary purpose of this is just to, um, I think, frame and hopefully illuminate some themes that that uh, were either very uh, kind of implicit in the readings or, or just kind of not mentioned at all. Um, because I think this is a, a very, very rich period, and it's, it's unfortunate that we, uh, understandable, that we have to kind of do it all at once. Um, the Da Vinci readings, you know, of course, were, I think, just uh, amazing, and I think that a lot is going on there, so read those very carefully, even though it seems at times he's just kind of making very banal scientific statements. It's his his stuff on what the eye is and how the eye projects itself onto the world his his uh, his stuff about the connection of spirit and movement I think are, are profoundly philosophical and anticipate uh, a lot of modern uh, trends like phenomenology uh, but also even uh, evolution and uh, and things like this so uh, read that very carefully it's very rich the Beardsley reading um, it, you know, you could. It seemed that a lot of, and it, again, it's understandable that it seemed a, a bit flat, uh, kind of emphasizing harmony and unity and order because there isn't much extant theory of art per se. But there are a few things that I think weren't in the readings that that I want to kind of use um, some philosophical themes that that will illuminate this, uh, because it is a rich, rich period. Just the sheer number of different. Arts. Uh, you had uh, architecture, the great cathedrals. You had painting. You had mosaic. You had chant. Uh, illuminated manuscripts. Um, I mean, just just this wonderful kind of cornucopia of of different uh, uh, technical arts, but also uh, arts. You know, uh, dealing with uh, what I take to be the, the most important, the deepest questions, and which are the religious questions. And a lot of times, you know, this is called the Dark Ages, and it's hardly dark. I mean, it's, it's, it's chocked full of light, in fact, and blood and drama and all of these kind of things. And I think that uh, a lot of the, the kind of glossing over of this period, at least in the history of philosophy, uh, really betrays a certain arrogance or dogma um, uh, as to uh, what was being dealt with because the the Middle Ages, the medieval period, uh, is, is that crucial bridge that uh, kind of comments on the classical period but also sets the stage for the modern period. And uh, I think that there's a lot of uh, very important deep uh, questions that are going on here. The major philosophical um, paradigm that was operative at the beginning of the, the medieval period uh, is called Neoplatonism. And it's advocated by people like Plotinus and then Philo and then uh, influenced Augustine and things like this. Um, but Neoplatonism um, offers that kind of uh, bridge again between Platonic and Greek philosophy and um, a, a lot of Christian theology and Christian cosmology and views on the creation of the universe and the status of the material world. Um, but basically, Neoplatonism uh, was an attempt to tackle the question, the kind of big philosophical question of the relationship of the one to the many uh, and the relationship of the, the immaterial world, uh, what Plato called the realm of the forms, the intelligible realm, and the material world, the realm of bodies, the realm of change. And uh, the most famous thinker, Plotinus, um, and as well as the other ones, kind of took that branch of, of mysticism um, uh, that, is, that runs through Plato and, and, and ran with it. And uh, ultimately we see um, this kind of later influencing, some, influencing uh, later mystic uh, poets and, and thinkers and religious thinkers like Meister Eckhart and, and things like this. Uh, but again, the big question is, is trying to offer a theory that, that kind of reconciles these, these contradictions and paradoxes. And one of the metaphors they use is, is the metaphor of light, which you know, we kind of already see in Plato with the simile of the sun and, and the good as the super form that's analogous to the sun in the intelligible realm. But it's made uh, really explicit in, in uh, the Neoplatonists. And one way they do it is to try to kind of 
not collapse the two worlds, but have them uh, in, a, in a kind of intimate relation as, as different modes of one truth, one reality. And the metaphor that is, is used um, is, is one of emanation. And it, since I don't have the chalkboard, I drew just a little picture on a piece of paper here. So it would be like a, um, a prism where you have the one, the unchanging kind of reality that, that is the true, the, the beautiful, the good, all of these things that Plato talk about, that when it goes through a prism, it splits into the spectrum, the many different colors that we see. So to us, we see many different things, but it's still just light just light in its, its different forms. So it, it, it emanates, and all of material creation is an emanation because that one, that divine kind of unity, is so just super abundant. Uh, it, it overflows, and it, it, it can't help but overflow into this uh, manifold reality of many changing things that we see. Um, so it's 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 uh, again it's it's an attempt to uh, you know acknowledge a certain dualism, but at the same time to explain that that dualism away uh, by making that connection explicit and intimate um, uh, uh, through this this metaphor of of light and and emanation. Oh, one thing, one thing I forgot to say this because. Uh, anticipating what we're going to say about the status of the body. So this is just from um, uh, just a collection on uh, Renaissance philosophy by uh, Forrest Baird, and he's talking about Plotinus. So there's this this mystical strand that runs through this that is in Plato, but uh, it's really, really explicit in, in a lot of these thinkers. Uh, but he says, the goal of philosophy, this is talking about Aquin, uh, Plotinus, the goal of philosophy is to awaken individuals to recognize reality beyond the material world. But philosophy alone cannot take a person to the highest reality of the one slash good. Only in mystical experience can an individual unite with the one. Plotinus himself claimed to have achieved such a union, a, quote, flight of the alone to the alone, to cite his famous words, four times during his life. His experiences of non-material reality were so powerful that he said he was, quote, ashamed to have a body. So we'll see that this is one of the big questions that is being wrestled with in the medieval period, the philosophical questions. But I, I think that it's, it's really kind of comes out in art. Whether it was conscious or not, we see um, this, this kind of theme coming out through art. But the question is, especially with, with the, the uh, Christian thinkers. The question is, how is it that we can have a body, a body which is fallen, which is corrupt, which is lustful, which changes, which gets old, which gets horny, gets hungry, dies, all of these things that are kind of pulling us away from this kind of divine unity. How can we have that and acknowledge it's all of these kind of bad slash evil things about it, while at the same time acknowledge the fact that this creation, both our bodies and all of nature, are creations of God. So that the human form is imago Dei, is in the image and likeness of God. That nature is something that is created by God and therefore good. So I, I think that, that this is the big kind of philosophical question that is anticipated by the Neoplatonists, pre-Christian, but then taken up by uh, a lot of the, the um, uh, medieval philosophers and, and medieval artists. And inside of that is, is a question of the question of evil. Um, you know, what is the status of evil? And this begins with, you know, if the basic question is, is if God is all good, all powerful, all knowing, uh, why is there evil in the world? Um, either, you know, he created evil and uh, he, he, does, he allows these atrocious things to happen and he chooses not to stop it. Uh, or evil is some kind of uh, other entity that is, is out of his control. Um, uh, or, um, you know, if he did create such horrible things, then how can we call him uh, all good and uh, all knowing? 
if evil is a result of our own free will, it's not God that does it, it's us that we chose to eat eat the apple and murder babies and do all of these kind of things. Um, if it is from the free will, how can we reconcile our freedom with, with God's omniscience and God's omnipotence? Um, so these are all these are just questions. I mean, it's it's kind of a there's obviously tomes and tomes of, of papers and thought on this issue. But the question of evil, I think, is is also kind of uh, uh, dealt with, is tied up with this question of the status of material reality and and bodies.